Hello everyone, Tyler from DualCasterMage.com here. This week I'm bringing you a deck tech that I've been meaning to put together for quite some time. Paradox Sisse Combo for Dual Commander. This is a very unique deck that I would classify as Adaptive Combo, which means that it has a game-winning combo plan A that can win as early as turn 3, but you can also tailor your strategy to what your opponent is doing if you need to in order to not die, or if it would benefit you to present a slower but more resilient game plan. In that regard and several others, it's a lot like Arkham Dagson, who I've featured on this channel before. Unlike Arkham though, Sissy has a lot more game if plan A fails. This is one of my favorite decks of all time, and if you're like me, you gotta have a special respect for any commander from the pre-modern card frame era that can still be competitive. I mean seriously, the legends back then sucked so bad, it's truly amazing that even one can still be played with a straight face. Check out the video description below if you want to see the full deck list. I also put links down there to each of the subsections of this video in case you want to skip ahead to a particular part. And finally, I just wanted to mention that the Dual Caster Mage channel just turned one year old this week, so I wanted to give a huge thank you to all my subscribers who helped me grow in the last year. It's been an amazing journey so far, and I have a ton of cool new stuff coming down the pipeline for August and September, though I'm not quite ready to disclose the full details just yet, but stay tuned, I promise you're in for a treat. Alright, enough of me yapping, let's get to the deck tech. Let's begin with the general strategy or game plan for this deck, which is a lot more complicated than your typical dual commander deck. Plan A, the combo route, not surprisingly revolves around the card Paradox Engine, a relatively new card from Aether Revolt. The printing of this card forced a complete rethinking of the Captain Sisse deck, which prior to the engine was typically a slow, plodding, value toolbox or hate bears deck. Some people went a little far on the all-in combo when the engine was first printed, but most, including myself, have tapered back to a sort of hybrid, adaptive combo deck as I mentioned earlier. The really interesting thing is that there are many paths to victory via Paradox Engine. I used to have Aetherflux Reservoir as my primary combo win condition, but that strategy has a pretty big weakness, which is that it's technically non-infinite. You could fizzle out, and it requires requires you to play a lot of crappy one-drop legends. Eventually I realized that I could make the deck a lot more streamlined by going for an infinite loop instead. As it turns out, there are at least two such loops that I've found to be compact enough to include in the deck for redundancy's sake. To fit both combos in only takes five dedicated slots in your deck, and only two of those cards are ones that I would consider completely useless if you're not comboing off. So how do these combos work exactly? Well, the setup is the same for both. Let's go through that. To begin the combo, you need to have the following things to be true at a minimum. Captain Sisse is in play without summoning sickness, you have access to enough mana to play Paradox Engine, and you have literally any follow-up spell on enough mana to cast it. Sometimes just the 5 mana for the engine is sufficient for this since there are a lot of free spells in the deck. That's it! Before Dominaria came out, you also needed another non-land mana source like a Dork or a Mana Rock, but now with the printing of Mox Amber you don't even need that. The first step is to use Sisse's ability to tutor up Paradox Engine, cast the engine, and then cast your follow-up spell. This untaps Sisse for another bite at the apple. Tap Sisse and tutor up Mox Amber. This triggers Paradox Engine again. Tap Mox Amber for green mana, so G floating. Tap Sisse to tutor up Mox Opal. Cast the Opal. This triggers Engine again. Tap the Mox in for two more green mana, so GGG floating. Tap Sisse to tutor up and cast Seton, Croson Protector. He's actually super useful because he's another legendary card that can effectively produce mana with haste. Now you have at least three mana sources that untap every time you cast a spell, which is the bare minimum you need to win the game off the Blasting Station loop. Often you'll have even more mana sources since you'll have a mana dork or rock in play from earlier, but regardless, at this point you're pretty much able to tutor up anything you want, play it immediately, and get all your mana back. If you've gotten this far and your opponent hasn't done anything to stop you, you can be 99% confident you're going to win the game this turn. There are just a couple more optional steps I usually take in the setup phase just in case something crazy happens. They also allow you to accumulate mana faster. Once Seton is in play, tutor up Reiki, the history of Kamigawa with Sisei. Reiki is not strictly necessary, but he allows you to accumulate a ton of cards in hand as you're finishing out the loop, and you might draw into a protection spell or a non-legendary druid that could let you win faster with Seton. After Reiki, tutor up Rofellos, Lanowar Emissary. He's the only other legendary druid in the deck besides Seton, so he can be tapped for mana immediately using Seton's ability for more mana redundancy. After Rafelos, tutor up Bow of Nylea. The bow is critical to both of the infinite loops because of its ability to tuck cards from your graveyard to the bottom of your library. The rest of the abilities on bow may as well be flavor text, but they can still be useful if you draw it naturally and need to survive in the mid game. Alright, this is where the combo lines diverge. 
The Safi Monument combo is my first preference for a few reasons. One, each piece is directly tutorable by Sisse. Two, it wins without targeting your opponent, so player hexproof effects like Leyline of Sanctity do nothing to stop it. And three, it wins without dealing damage, so damage prevention effects like Glacial Chasm don't stop it either. The downside is that it requires four mana per loop, one GGW, as opposed to the Blasting Station combo which only requires three mana. Here's how it works. You tutor up Bantu's Monument. This lets you drain your opponent for one life every time you cast a creature. Then you tutor up Safi, Eric's daughter. She is completely unremarkable except for the fact that she's a cheap legend that sacrifices herself for free. Cast Safi, which triggers the monument. Then sacrifice her, targeting whatever, doesn't matter. Activate Bow of Nylea, putting Safi from your graveyard to the bottom of your library. Use Sisse to tutor up Safi and repeat the loop until your opponent is dead. Remember that you need to be able to produce at least one GGW in mana from non-land mana sources for each iteration of the loop. The Blasting Station combo is a bit more convoluted than the Monument combo, but only costs 2 and a green per loop, so it can be useful if you're mana crunch due to your Moxin, Seton, or Rafelos being destroyed earlier in the game. The problem is that the key card, Blasting Station, is not legendary, so you have to find another way to tutor it up. If you've already used your land play up this turn, tutor up and cast Azusa, Lost but Seeking. If you haven't used your land play yet, you can skip this step. Then tutor up the land, Inventor's Fair, which is legendary. You'll already have Metalcraft at this point if you have Paradox Engine and the Moxin in play. Play. so you can immediately tutor up Blasting Station with it. Be careful at this point though, you need to have at least 7 mana floating to do this in one go since playing Inventor's Fair does not trigger Paradox Engine. If this is a problem before going for Inventor's Fair, simply float extra mana and tutor up cheap legends such as Oath of Nyssa, Hope of Girapur, or Risk the Redeem to start netting mana on each cycle. This is another reason why I like to cast Reiki early on since he basically ensures that you'll never run out of cheap spells to cast in the event that you need to accumulate a bunch of mana. Then you cast Blasting Station. If you haven't already, tutor up either of your one-drop legendary creatures, Hope of Girapur or Risk the Redeemed. Hope of Girapur is generally easier due to its generic mana cost. Cast it, then sacrifice it to Blasting Station to ping your opponent for one. Activate Bow of Nylea to put Hope of Girapur on the bottom of your deck. Tutor up the Hope with Sisse, then rinse and repeat until your opponent is dead. If you really want to rub it in, you can also kill all their creatures and Planeswalkers too. So those are the two main combos. They each rely heavily on Bow of Nylea, which is difficult to get back if it's lost, so be careful with that one. The only way you have to get it back in the deck is Noxious Revival. Some other key pieces to keep in mind are, do not, under 99% of circumstances, cast Paradox Engine unless you have a follow-up spell to play immediately that leads to you winning in the same turn. You really don't want to let them untap and expose the engine to removal. On that note, sequencing matters a lot. You have to keep in mind the castability of the follow-up spell on the turns leading up to the combo turn. Sometimes this means holding onto a spare mana dork even though you could have played it earlier in the game. You don't want to be stuck in a situation where you can cast the engine but the only other spell in your hand is Elish Norn. Remember that you can cast Astral Corn Cornucopia and Everflowing Chalice for zero in this spot to get the ball rolling. Don't even cast Paradox Engine if you suspect they have a counterspell or instant speed artifact removal. Losing the engine sets your combo back at least two turns, which is basically forever in a deck like this. However, don't be scared of instant speed creature removal. If they let you untap with Sisse, chances are good they don't have anything. If you can give Sisse haste via Lightning Greaves or Thousand Year Elixir, it's often correct to tutor for Mox Amber first on their end step. This protects Paradox Engine from discard and ensures you have a cheap follow-up spell when you tutor for and play the engine on your next turn. Always float as much mana as possible from all your sources between Paradox Engine triggers while comboing off. Generally, you need a lot more green mana than white mana, so keep that in mind, especially early on when you're going for Seton and each mana counts. What happens when your opponent thwarts your combo or you're missing your fifth mana source for Paradox Engine? Well, then you gotta go on the warpath, son. There are too many lines of play to cover everything in this primer, but there are a few key targets I find myself going back to again and again to pull myself out of holes. This is all assuming you have an active Sisse. If the board's pretty much at parity, your opponent is tapped out, and or you have a ton of non-land mana sources, a great tutor target is Hokori Dust Drinker. This little guy is literally a winter orb on a stick and often prevents your opponent from doing anything long enough for you to combo off. If you don't have enough mana to cast Engine in a follow-up spell and you're under a lot of pressure, tutor up Urza's Ruinous Blast. This is another great addition from Dominaria that can allow you to come back from an otherwise unwinnable position. If you somehow snuck Sisley into play but you suspect your opponent has a counterspell up now, tutor up Dragonlord Dramoka. This beefy boy fulfills a few roles. He can be a win condition himself, but he can also allow you to combo off through counter magic if he survives a turn cycle. If a specific permanent such as Null Rod is preventing you from going off, or you just need to kill one thing that's threatening you immediately, tutor up Karn 
liberated. Since Planeswalkers are legendary now, you can 100% do this. This rules change is another reason why Sissa got a real power up in the last couple of years. If you're playing against red aggro and you just need a huge efficient life linking threat to stabilize, tutor up Lyra Dawnbringer. And don't forget the classic Umazawa's Jita, which can pull you out of a number of holes. Whew, okay, that took a while. Like I said, this deck isn't for the impatient or faint of heart. Now I just want to briefly cover the main categories of spells to give you a broader sense of the deck. The game plan of this deck incentivizes you to play as few lands as possible for a couple reasons. One, having non-land mana sources makes going off with Paradox Engine much easier. And two, it's harder to have that critical, cheap follow-up spell to Paradox Engine if your deck is running a high land count. You might just get flooded. I only run 35 lands in my version, and others have tried to get away with even fewer. But I think 35 is a sweet spot because you really want to make at least 3-4 to four land drops as you're setting up your combo. This opens up a lot of room for non-land spells, but for better or worse, a lot of these slots are immediately sucked back up by creature and artifact mana ramp. It's by far the largest category in the deck, with 14 mana dorks and 7 mana rocks. But they are very important since they allow you to combo off much more quickly. I already spoke in detail about the combo pieces, so I won't rehash those. The next category is an interesting one, various utility legends. Some of these end up being relevant for the combo, while others are in there just to allow you a plan B when the combo fails. I already spoke about several of these too. These are some of the biggest flex slots and good candidates for upgrades as WotC prints more and more sweet green and white legends. Then we have a big category which may seem unnecessary at first glance, but I assure you it's not. Protection for Sisse and the combos. This includes some classics like Mother of Runes and Sylvan Safekeeper, alongside some more underplayed cards like Faith Shield and Heroic Intervention. Look, when you're playing a non-blue combo deck, you need to find creative ways to protect your combo. Though you don't have access to hard counters, God's Willing can effectively act as a counter to spot removal while also working as a follow-up spell to Paradox Engine. This is really crucial. Moving on, we have a light suite of interaction and removal. The constraints of the deck prevent including a lot of these, unfortunately, so the ones that remain are the best at what they do and pack a punch. Dust to Dawn is some nice tech that can be a one-sided wrath while also getting you back tons of dead creatures in the long game. I originally didn't include the Winter Orb and Armageddons in the deck, but they slot in perfectly as incidental ways to leverage the huge number of non-land mana sources you want to be running anyway. Finally, there are a few random utility and synergy cards. Noxious Revival, for example, doubles as a way to get back a legend from your graveyard and as a free follow-up spell to cast after Paradox Engine. The only other thing I want to mention about the lands is that there are four legendary lands that can tap for colored mana immediately. These can be really useful to tutor up with Sisse in a pinch. And before you fire up your keyboards to yell at me for omitting Gaia's Cradle, I'd like to kindly remind you that Cradle is banned in Dual Commander. Obviously that card would be an amazing inclusion if it were legal. Probably the best strength of this deck is that it's extremely consistent. As long as you can untap with Sissa, you can generally win the game in the same way each time. Some might be turned off to the deck for this reason, but I find that plan A gets disrupted often enough that I have to navigate unique situations and find unconventional ways to win, and that doing so is extremely satisfying. Another strength is that since it isn't super well known, sometimes your opponent won't know exactly how you win. So they'll let you untap with Sisse while they tap out and develop their own board. I wouldn't say this is common, but it's not all that uncommon either. This lets you win on easy mode and is definitely an advantage of playing the deck. Having the combo allows you to use your life total and your board as a resource, since you don't really need to be chipping in for damage or finding your way around blockers. Only your last point of life matters, so you can let your opponent do pretty much whatever they want on their side of the board as long as they don't kill you or Sisse. Playing against aggro and especially mid-range decks is decently favorable as your combo is faster than they can kill you with beatdown. Even tempo decks might have a hard time against Sisse since you can deploy so much mana so quickly. Finally, not being all in on the combo means you don't fool to a single counter spell or removal spell. There's a decent percentage of games you can win by going Elf in the Selfless Spirit into GTA Equip, or just plop a Lyra Dawnbringer down and your opponent will have a hard time winning. The biggest weakness of Captain Sisse is that, at the end of the day, you're still pretty reliant on your commander, and untapping with her is easier said than done. Assuming your opponent is not a complete idiot, they will do everything in their power to take her out ASAP with extreme prejudice. You're playing very much on the nose in that regard, and she's about as fragile and permanent as they come. However, a simple way to counter that is to wait to cast Sisse until you can protect her with a 1 mana protection spell like Faith's Shield. Another weakness is control decks, especially those packing mass removal. Getting wrathed even once is extremely painful as it sets you back so far that you're unlikely to win. The deck runs very few lands, so if all your mana dorks die with Sisse, you're looking at ages before you can recast her from the command zone. Counter spells are rough too, since your opponent has a two-turn window to completely stop your combo in its tracks, countering Sisse right off the bat, or countering Paradox Engine on the following turn. 
Overall, Dual Commander is a hostile environment for a creature-based combo deck because, unlike multiplayer EDH, one-for-one -one removal is everywhere. It's gonna feel like fighting an uphill battle a lot of the time, and when Sisse is dead on arrival, the game will look like a complete slaughter. Finally, there's the logistical weakness that playing the deck in any online software is a huge pain in the ass. As an infinite combo, it requires a lot of time and a lot of clicks, and if you screw up just once, you might ruin your chances of successfully going off. Also, there's always a certain subset of salty sallies who hate combo and won't scoop even when you demonstrate an infinite loop. So keep that in mind if that might be an issue for you. Alright, thanks for sticking with me all the way through this long-ass primer. I didn't intend for it to be this long, but this is the most complicated deck I've featured so far, so I think the length was justified. If you want to see some gameplay videos of the deck in action, just click on the Captain Sisse playlist in the playlist section of my channel. There's also a link in the video description. Let me know in the comments what you think of the deck. Would you ever consider playing a linear combo deck like this? Why or why not? Did I miss any sweet legends that either help the combo or shore up some of the deck's weaknesses? I'm really curious to hear your feedback. And please subscribe if you found this information valuable. I'd love to grow the channel at an even faster pace in year two, but I need your help to do so. Okay, that's it. Thanks for watching, guys.